Hello everyone, TRG30 is back. It's February the 3rd. We're so pleased to have you with us again. Welcome to those that are joining us for the first time. Lots of newbies today. It's so great to have you with us and welcome as always to those that are back with us. Happy New Year, Jill. Oh, Stephen, Happy New Year to you. I'm so glad to be back with everyone for TRG30 and glad to say 2021 on the end of, of this date. <laughs> We're here, we're here. Just a couple of things, Jill, before we kick off today to let you know about this a little bit different. The Q&A button, don't forget the bottom of the screen, you can still submit your questions, but also the chat function on Zoom is open. This is a round table and we'd love if you have any comments or thoughts as we step through the 30 minutes today, please feel free to add them in there and uh, our colleague Caitlin will be standing by to reply to you and engage in that chat. Or you can just sit back with your tea, coffee or wine if you're in the UK and enjoy the next 30 minutes. Jill. Great. TRG30, Stephen, we're back. Same idea though, bold change, bold ideas for our sector's resilience and return, we hope in 2021 to live. And maybe it will feel a little bit like a return to life. Today, we're going to be talking about philanthropy. It's a reflection on our sixth report from our COVID art sector benchmark. This time, as I said, focusing on philanthropy, we'll be looking back at 2020 and look then forward to 2021, what those realities mean to our opportunities. As always, I want you to be listening with a particular set of questions in mind. First of all, as you compare your organization to the aggregate results from the benchmark, how does your situation compare? And if you find yourself saying, wow, look at us, we are one of those bright spots, bright spots how will you push the pedal down? Um, what will you do differently? And with that in mind, let's always be thinking about action. What might this mean to your commitments to a new kind of action in 2021? Okay, so just as a reminder, uh, as we kick off the new year, last year we launched the COVID-19 sector benchmark with our critical UK partners, Purple 7. This report and benchmark is also supported by the NEA, the National Endowment for the Art, and our partner, SMU Data Arts. It, the, the benchmark aggregates transactional data from CRM, customer relationship management, and other transaction systems. And the intention is to measure the impact of the pandemic on arts participation. Soon, we will be measuring the rate of our sector's recovery. In our latest report, we've focused on philanthropy. You have received and will after this um, an opportunity to download this report um, from hundreds of organizations who reported. So let's start at the top. The biggest headline here is revenues, and they're down, of course, both in North America and the UK, both sides of the Atlantic. So in North America, 2020 philanthropic results were down, revenues were down 13%, 32% in the UK. However, there was a, a real regional difference in the number of gifts. So in North America, the number of charitable gifts grew by 15% and fell at a slower rate in the UK on the number side compared to revenues, but fell. So that's the top line look. Let's look a little bit below the fold at the nuance. And there's some really interesting narratives here. In the full report, you're gonna get the complete suite of data. I know there are many um, of our fellow data geeks out there that will dig into those data and tables and analysis and more. But today we're gonna to pull out three top line narratives to get you thinking about your philanthropic approach in 2021. And they are these. There are some surprising major gift results in this study. There's a definite connection between where we saw growth and gift size. And finally, relationship, relationship, relationship. We heard last year, you heard us say, relationships and innovation, that's what's going to move us out of this crisis and into resiliency. We did see re-engagement in relationships in ways that I'm going to detail for you. Okay. So let's start here with major gifts. 
Now, I don't have a slide full of numbers and data. So literally, I want you to pull your pencils out and write this stuff down. It will help you absorb the information. It'll also give you something to reference when you download the report and start looking at the detail itself. Okay, the top line is 2019 did not predict 2020's major gifts. So organizations that had smaller, think in the context of an aggregated benchmark, so smaller means at the median level or lower, smaller major gift results in 2019 actually saw growth or stability in 2020. So if your own program had smaller than the aggregate results in 19, while you might have been hand wringing about that um, at the time, you likely saw growth or stability during the 2020 year. Those organizations that saw higher than the median and large um, major gifts in 2019 actually saw the same number of gifts, but with smaller average gift size. Same number, smaller average gift size. Surprising, but intuitive. The theory here is that in those markets, in those situations, we have uh, givers who said, I'm going to take my giving and spread it. Spread the love during this pandemic and give less to more causes and organizations. The same was true in the UK. So if your major donors increased in 2020, the question is, have you developed a plan to maintain them and keep them at those levels? And if yours have declined, what are you thinking about the individual approaches you'll need to tailor to those patrons? What is your narrative, your posture as you are describing your organization's impact? I was reminded yesterday um, by my new friend, Melissa Crowley at the Arts Funders Forum that the next generation of philanthropists care about the community, it, the community they operate in, their specific needs, social justice and, and more. And I'd argue that we need to do a much better job in tying arts and culture to a community social capital. Social capital, arts and culture contributes to it meaningfully. How is your message reinforcing this? All right, number two, huge growth in small gifts. So while the biggest and smallest teeny tiny gifts fell in the UK, those in the middle range, think 50 to 500 pounds, actually rose by almost 150%. And in North America, the same category of giving um, saw 20% growth. And it's where actually in North America, we saw the growth in the number of total gifts. We need to not let these patrons go. Let's not just think about this year, but think about the next decade of impact that those patrons can fuel if they're well-managed and attended to. They can help your organization and artists contribute to your community social capital. Let's not let this be a blip. It will need attention and maintenance to grow and, and, and um, build the gift numbers and not see revenues slide. So huge smooth, huge growth in small gifts. And third and finally, lapsed patrons came back big time. Now, you know, at TRG, we're always looking for segment level data to understand, um, better understand results. So this report looks at three donor types, renewing, new, and re-engaged or lapsed. And this lapsed group is comprised of patrons who had not behaved or transacted or been involved prior to 2020 for 18 months. So this group was compelled by the stress that our field had. And in North America, this group grew their engagement by 70% in terms of the number of gifts and almost 100% in revenue. Similarly, in the UK, it's a smaller pool, but from the same lapsed group, we saw nearly triple the result. It's big and it made up um, for real loss that we felt from an experience from current donors. So again, what's the plan? How are we keeping these re-engaged patrons close? And as important, with such success in this segment, how are you leaning in and continuing to build ties? 
So those are the three top line narratives from the report. Let's get to what it means in terms of action. Let's first know who gave. These people are the superheroes. They were there when you needed them the most. We need to know things about them first. Second, we need to make plans to listen. I'm gonna keep saying this, listening is the new talking. Listening is the new talking. And finally, we, we've got to have whip smart, really at, at, at well executed and well focused uh, campaigns stronger than ever before they must be. So as it relates to knowing who uh, gave in 2020, we don't need all of the data, but some top line revenue and gift numbers and, um, uh, and other details will help with the narrative that rounds them out, things like this. Are they renewing donors or new? Were they upgrading, staying the same, downgrading? Are they, who are they? Did they come from out of town? What did they um, look like demographically? Transaction types, are they in the UK? Many of these donors are oh, turned back their tickets. Uh, what was their recent donation? So let's look for the nuance in who they are and then create a plan that helps us really know them, to the, a plan that cultivates and stewards these people now and moving forward. So first, knowing who gave and creating a plan to really know them is, is critically important. The second is listening up. And listening is a muscle that we've got to develop. You heard us talk about this last year, both internally and externally. So internally, we've got to listen to each other to get the full picture, to enable us to optimize those plans. And to, to do this listening, we really need process. You'll remember me talking about Seth Godin's new book, The Practice, and in it, he says he, that he reports about sculptor Elizabeth King, who said process, process saves us from the poverty of our intentions process saves us from the poverty of our intentions. So if we intend on listening to each other, then we need a process to do it so that we can tap the expert stewards in our development departments. We can utilize the expertise in results-driven campaigns in marketing, our guest services and box offices who are a direct line to patrons, they know things. If we're listening to each other, we will be better armed to do the second step which is to listen to our patrons and our audiences. So we need to ask questions and then stop talking. Then stop talking. To serve our community and our audiences, we have to know what they're thinking, what they're feeling. So we again, we need process here. Formal mechanisms can be the net promoter system. Go back, um, if you're not as familiar with that, in June, I interviewed the the um, designer and originator of the net promoter system, Fred Reichelt, open houses, one-on-one -on -one meetings that enable you to listen through data or one-on-one -on -one connection to your patrons and audiences. And then we need these campaigns, whip smart campaigns that deliver the right message to the right person at the right time, but on steroids. And, and the reason for on steroids is that nothing is the same. Our 2020 relationships ended up practically and meaningfully being different than they had been in previous years. So our campaigns, our narratives, our messages need to act like it. So think about the donors who are donors through their ticket turn back, or these laps patrons who who um, heeded the call and gave at this time, or subscribers who have their money on account uh, for, and may have had it for more than a year. This is gonna require cooperation and collaboration and our ability to harness the creativity that exists in our organizations and really um, well, this kind of listening, this kind of campaign will require the discernment that tracks back to the beginning, knowing who they are, then listening, and then building these campaigns. So Stephen, I know you do all kinds of um, uh, consulting and talk to many of our clients. 
these kinds of practices and more are critical right now. And I'm just curious about what questions might be coming across the transom or anything that you're thinking as you listen to me describe these things. Yeah, thank you, Jill. And um, don't forget, you can submit your questions uh, with the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and I'll, I'll take those as they come in. But um, there's a lot to think about here, Jill. I've got a question immediately around uh, collaboration between marketing and development, because we talk about that. We talked about that before 2020, right? Right. And I wonder if there are examples where there are teams breaking down silos today uh, or rethinking their approach. I win a point for the first mention of silos in 2021. But is there is there good examples that that you would share or, or, or a first step, perhaps, if that's a challenge? Um, uh, in, in an organization of someone watching us today? There are tons of examples actually that we um, have experienced and seen during this pandemic time. Zoom created a very different reality, didn't it? It, it enabled us to be engaging across teams in a more um, easy and <clears throat> kind of nimble fashion that doesn't automatically create process though. So here are some steps that I've seen organizations take and that I'd recommend um, this, um, this uh, questioner take. Uh, the first would be to share databases and segmentation and audiences. So kind of get out on the table. Who is it that marketing is talking to? Who is it that development teams are talking to? And see what the data says about crossover, about the pathways from one kind of engagement to another, so that you can see where the Venn diagram is between what marketing is attending to and what development is attending to. So start with data. Then begin to um, build campaigns. One of the biggest um, ways that we can feel uh, good about collaboration is if we do things together and get success from it. So as we think about the upcoming philanthropic campaigns that are coming up maybe through year end, or as we consider um, getting back to a 21-22 season or a subscription campaign, there are going to be um, they're going to want to be campaigns and messages that consider Jill totally, not separately. So building campaigns and managing those or monitoring those results to see their success rate. Will, and, and I anticipate they together will be higher than if they'd been separate based on our um, experience. You'll, you'll get a, a boost in and see the evidence um, uh, about collaboration. And then there's just communication, you know, mm -hmm. creating a, a way for people in those teams to meet and talk about their activities and plans, their calendars and efforts so that they can, the, the teams can exploit the things that are happening in different departments. Those are some simple first steps that, that organizations can take. Mm. I like that idea of meeting together. I mean, we talk about revenue pacing meetings, right? But actually, this is an opportunity for a patron pacing meeting to talk oh. about these segments and how we're talking uh, in a coherent way. Uh, Sebastian um, Warwick from here in the UK actually has talked about um, post-redundancy that now the development comms and front of house departments are merged into an mm. external relations department. Yep. And you know, it's sad that we've had to say goodbye to so many people over the last year, but there's also, if the right word is opportunity in how we rebuild our teams to be patron focused on the other side of this. Yeah. Um, there's a question here around um, that says, yeah, I hear you, Jill. We need new processes to steward donors this year, but how much of that will remain relevant after we come back to normal, whatever normal looks like? Well, um, I want to knit together what Sebastian um, said with this question. Um, this time has caused disruption and disruption um, can be good. So my hope would be that the things that we're doing now that would um, integrate out of either purpose or, or practicality, our development, marketing, and box office operations would find their way into the way that we think about campaigns and the, and the specific recommendations that we made today about knowing and listening and segmenting campaigns that talk to Jill specifically, those practices uh, must 
they must stay so that we uh, can continue to be as resilient and relevant in our communities as we need to be, especially over the next three to five years as, as our communities are recovering. So I, I think this is part of the new normal. I sure hope it's part of the new normal. And the challenge will be how do we infrastructure it and, um, and, and continue to build on uh, doing it. But I sure hope it sticks. Mm. Stephanie asks, uh, uh, our organization is looking at more of an equity lens and looking at the digital divide. How do we look for these audience and art groups when they are harder to find or access? Yeah, well, this, this is one of the um, other um, bright spots from this pandemic because digital audiences um, are different. They come from outside of our communities sometimes in unexpected ways, and they come from different parts of our community in, in exciting ways. So the relationship um, goals, you know, need to be, need to match up with those people in the ways that meet them. But the first step is to make sure that we've got contact information, some kind of system that um, forces people to register so that we have an ability to know who Jill is and an ability to start talking to Jill about the things that are coming up, <clears throat> excuse me, and the and listen to Jill's one-on-one -on -one or as a segment to understand what the needs and interests are. You know, the, uh, Stephen, we talk a lot about the word loyalty and in the context of equity, diversity and inclusion, I feel like loyalty sometimes means traditional audiences. It, it, mm -hmm. it, it is combined to mean that in people's head. So I've started to use the word relationship um, we, are, we are working to create long-term relationships with existing audiences and patrons and new audiences and patrons. And what we need is the listening muscle that ensures that we're hearing what those different audiences and patrons need and delivering it at the right time in the right way. We hear, we hear a lot the challenge of segmentation, right? Small teams. Yeah smaller teams, capacity crunch right now. Um, this question uh, talks about the ability to getting nuanced segmentation is hard in their CRM. What mm. ROI should they expect if this extra effort is undertaken? The end is the same, come back and buy. Will this, will mm. this level of segmentation really increase effectiveness? Well, you're gonna have to test and learn that. Um, I understand the reason for the question. And if I were in your shoes, I'd find out what is the what is the one piece of nuanced segmentation I could get my hands on, and um, deliver a campaign around that with the right with a different message, and test its result. I'll tell you we've we've been um, looking at this kind of data for the full twenty five years of our uh, consulting firm's history, and every time every time we deliver a particular message to a type of people, whether that's behavioral segmentation or demographic segmentation, if it's the right offer to the right person at the right time, you get lift in responsiveness. Now that's whitewashed. Um, your own data will tell that story, but I would encourage you to pick one or two things that you can do and test it and see. Um, my prediction is that you will get a different response and it will encourage you to continue and you'll be able to see what that meant in monetary terms and then turn back to your institution and say, look, this is what that achieved. Let's invest this next time and see if we can continue that good result. Sam here in the UK, hi Sam, has mm -hmm. is opening up the pricing can of worms for 2021. And so I'm sure we're gonna talk about this more, but yeah. how do you think um, patrons customers will respond to pricing in 2021 and beyond, and how will this intersect with donations? Yeah, it's a super interesting question and complicated, and we need you know, a half-day seminar on this, as Sam <laughs> knows. Um, uh, the ver I, don't have, I don't have answers, I have variables. The variables will have to do with supply and demand, as it always does. The variables will have to do with our mission, and what our incentives, our own organizational incentives are, 
to open up doors to different parts of our communities. But that um, opening up doors to different parts of our communities, it doesn't always mean that we have to lower prices or create deep discounts, but sometimes it does. So how, what, how our missions are dictating our future will be one of those variables. And Sam's question was about philanthropy. And in 21, 22, um, there's going to be, we're going to have to work together because there will be some probably older um, ticket booking households and ticket buyers who will not feel confident coming back. And so will we, how will we merge and create value for someone who wants to continue to invest in us, philanthropy, but can't attend necessarily. And how do, how do digital, um, and how does digital access another variable um, uh, way in here? So it's a, it's a really complicated time, um, but those are some of the things that I see, Stephen. I, I welcome your take too, but um, great question. I agree, and I th and I think you know a topic for a future TRG thirty for sure because this question is coming up yeah. also in our digital product that we're putting out, and we see interesting things in in the response to digital programming when it yep. comes to pricing too. Right, one final question, and then I know we're at time from Kurt. As you listen to these non traditional communities, are you seeing a resistance to the historically white centered structure of checking a box that limits self identification? Are there other ways to think about nuanced ethnicity or segmentation? Oh my gosh, Kurt, what a question. Um, I am confident there is, um, and I don't have the data, but I'm not, I, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised if there was resistance to it. And um, I would be looking at all of the information that I can't get a handle on um, that might be, um, uh, that might be available in my market by neighborhood or community. I would be looking to my partners, oh my gosh, partners in communities that would help me understand how I might connect with and talk to and ask for information in the right way without making my own assumptions about how I should be doing that. Um, again, this is another subject for another TRG30. I'm a I appreciate the question, um, but I, I'm reasonably confident, confident you're onto something there and we will have to be nuanced, nuanced and kind and um, kind of righteous in our um, intention uh, to do this uh, well. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you all for your questions today. We really appreciate it. Don't forget that TRG30 is back in two weeks um, but you'll still hear from us in that in that interim period of time. Um, some things to say to you. Uh, don't forget, if as you read our next benchmark insight report, you can contribute your data to the next report. So trgarts.com. If you've not already registered, please do. Uh, there are some new CRM systems that will come on board with collecting that data. But key, it's not just a tool for us to analyze and research the data. It will be increasingly a crucial tool for you to measure your way through uh, recovery uh, as we as we step through 2021 and to Jill to your point when we can gather together again for live performance we, yeah. we are looking forward to back that to moment life, back to life yep <laughs> so trgarts.com is the place to see past trg30s all through last year should you so desire uh, and lots more and we'll look forward to seeing you again in two weeks time thank you Jill Stephen, thank you. Thanks to everyone who joined us today. Look forward to seeing you again soon.